gonna sound good. Oh, what's up? Good thing we know so. We will have a smoke. So now, the head of the Jamaican delegation to Florida to the World Conference just also happened to have been the co-chair of said conference. Now, let me be very clear. <laughs> I am not saying that this is why Jamaicans were offering treatments all over the place. Um, I am sure the coincidence can be explained. Still, we have heard how well we were represented, and so whether any racket did I go on or not, <laughs> right? Is we passing, and we know same how we as big we up. So, please welcome with today's encouragement our pastor, Reverend John Scott. I'm so glad I made him a practitioner. Good morning, sons and daughters of the light. Uh, joy to add my own words of welcome to the beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in sunny, warm, gorgeous Jamaica. And a word of welcome, too, to those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. So there are three little boys in the schoolyard, and they're bragging about their fathers. And the first little boy says, <laughs> My daddy good, you see. He scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a poem, and they give him $5,000. Other little boy says, Cha, my daddy, my daddy scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song, and they give him $5,000. The third little boy says, that I know nothing. My daddy scribbles a few words on some pieces of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. <laughs> I don't call my, my talks a sermon because it sounds a bit preachy, and I don't feel that I am in a position where I can preach to you. So I've termed them encouragements. I call it an encouragement because I want everybody who hears them, either because they're here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica, or listening to us on the World Wide Web, I want everybody who hears the encouragement to feel encouraged, motivated, and in fact, driven to go out and let their light shine. I also want you to be encouraged to encourage us by giving a lot of love offering so that it takes eight people to collect it at the end of the talk. <laughs> Commercial. <laughs> so I've titled my encouragement today, You Are the Light. I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist, Psalm 139 verses 11 and 12, who says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. I believe, you know, most of us here know that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and omnipresent, everywhere equally evenly present. Everybody here agrees with that? Yes. Two people. Everybody here agrees? Yes. Everybody here agrees that God is the only presence and the only power and that there can be no power opposed to God? Yes. Ah, thank you. So the experience of darkness, which we all have from time to time, has to be a temporary experience. I believe it is a call for us when we, we experience any darkness. It's a call for us to turn on the light within each of us. But sometimes this can really be a, a, a tall order. Let us say, for example, a problem arises in your life. It may relate to work or finances or relationships or health. It may even relate to your spiritual path and sometimes it relates to all of the above. Sound familiar? 
At those times, you can feel like you're really separated from your good. And you ask yourself, but why is a nice person like me, a, a, a diligent truth student, uh, a, a, a deep believer in God and in all God's good, why is somebody like me experiencing this dark moment? And sadly, some people feeling overwhelmed by that darkness stop coming to church. I say sadly because it is precisely at those times, those dark times, that we need our spiritual family. All of us, and I mean all of us, ministers, practitioners, uh, students of truth, all of us go through periods like these, don't we? And often, it is hard to fathom when you're experiencing them, why you're experiencing them. It could possibly work this way. You discover this path of truth, and you learn how to pray affirmatively, how to meditate. You come to church and you feel a warmth, and a, you feel the love that is so absolutely evident here on a Sunday morning. If it's your first time, you, you feel like, ah, yes, I've come home. This is where I think I could find my spiritual place and put down my roots and bloom and grow. And once you choose the pathway, you begin a process of personal transformation, which can be quite astounding and breathtaking. It can be very, very fast, and you want to learn everything all at once, and you come to classes, and you come to services, and you come to Tuesday evening services, and what? Prayer power on a Thursday evening, I mean that too, and you're really into it. And then, The bottom seems to just drop out of the pot. And you think, wow, where did this come from? Reverend Dr. Emma Lumsden, who founded this center, used to say you know, that sometimes when you start dusting the house, what happens when you start dusting a really dusty room? Dust fly. Do you stop, do you stop dusting? No. You do like my beloved housekeeper, your damper cloth, and you wipe, and you wipe, and you wipe, until it is? clean. And then you know what happens if you leave it for a week? You lock up the house and leave it, you know. When you come back, what? Dust. So you see, you see, you have to keep dusting. You have to keep doing the spiritual work. My friend Larry Chang, who introduced me to this teaching, said, come John, let's dust off our consciousness. Come and pray with me. And so I want to just tell you that to give you a new perspective when you're feeling the darkness. Sometimes it is a very strong indication that powerful inner transformation is actually taking place. It is as if you have learned all you can learn up to this point and it, you have been internalizing it subconsciously and life says, no, prove me now. Use the teaching that you have been absorbing and embracing and espousing. And so don't feel disheartened when you, you, you find a period of darkness. Because all you need to do really is what? Turn on the light. But you see, when we're in the darkness, sometimes we feel like pulling the drapes shut, taking to our bed. Really, don't we? And we do the opposite of what we most need to do, which is? Open the drapes, turn on the light, and say, see me here, God. I'm going to prove what I've been learning now. Dr. Arnold Fox, who is a medical doctor who authored a book titled Beyond Positive Thinking, tells the story of a small, frail woman named Sally, who was a survivor of Nazi concentration camps. He met her when he had just become, he had just graduated you know, uh, um, if, if from his medical training. Sally was in a hospital ward dying of cancer, and she was regarded by everybody in the hospital as a very, very troublesome patient. She demanded to know what was in every syringe, and the nurse had to tell her what were the possible contraindications, and why did she have it now instead of at another hour? She complained about the lumpy hospital mattress, the food, and she was a thorn in their sides. Sally's story is very interesting. 
interesting because in addition to all the other trouble she gave, she insisted on keeping a lit candle on her nightstand beside her bed. Now, the hospital staff knew two things about her. One, that she was supposedly terminal, and somebody had written on her chart, SDTH. SDTH stood for start digging the hole. And it was an indication to their one another that it's OK, this, just put up with the, the nenge nenge and the complaining a little longer because it won't be long. There was no hope. Fox relates how late one night when he was on duty and he had a little spare time, he sat by Sally's bed and listened to her stories of the concentration camp. After she had described some of her adventures, he asked her, well, well how did you survive? You know, how did you survive the beatings and the, 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 the bitter cold and the starvation and the abuse and the exposure to severe conditions protected only by a few rags? Sally told him something which I find most interesting. She said, you know what, doctor? The people who survived there were the ones who believed they could survive. She said, and those people who believed they could survive fought with their every last ounce of strength for the, an extra crumb of bread, a small scrap of paper or a rag to put in their shoes to keep them warm or to patch a hole in the bottom of the shoes. They, they, they just put all their energy into surviving. She said, those who believed that they wouldn't survive died very quickly. And I'm reminded of, of a lesson from Jesus, the master, who said, it is done unto us as we believe. So Dr. Fox said to her, well, so the people who died didn't have any faith. She said, on the contrary. They had deep faith in their own demise. It's kind of like a negative use of faith, isn't it? And Sally told Dr. Fox something that is really quite amazing. The people who knew they would live, lived. And the people who knew they would die, died. Those who do not look for the opportunities never find them and never found them and died. And those who do look, because you know, even in a concentration camp, there are opportunities. Some, very, very few. But there are some opportunities. And I'm reminded of the film we just uh, saw. For those of you that came and saw the, um, uh, the film, uh, was it last Sunday? Yes, yeah, right. In the film, uh, this guy is in a prison cell. And the warder says to him, can you find any beauty in here? And he said, beauty in here, you're crazy. There's nothing beautiful in here. And he said, until you can find the beauty, you're never going to be able to survive this, this experience that you're having. So even in a concentration camp, there were opportunities. So he marveled, Dr. Fox, at the strength of this frail woman dying of cancer, a shadow of a, a person in the bed beside him. And he said, then you must have believed with all your might that you would survive. And she said, no. I thought I'd be dead in a week. He said, I don't understand you. You just told me that the people who believed lived, and the people who believed that they would die, died. You thought you were going to die in a week? Then what are you still doing here? If you didn't try, and you didn't believe you were going to survive, how did you stay alive? Fox asked. And Sally explained how her faith turned from negative to positive. She said there was an older woman, a veteran prisoner, who made her do a little ritual, which this woman performed every morning and every evening. Snatching back from their captors a few seconds of time twice a day, the woman lit an imaginary candle with an imaginary match. Setting the imaginary candle on a non-existent holder, she stepped back admiring the flame that was not there. As Fox put it, and I quote, 
Surrounded by filthy, starving, disease-ridden women who most likely would not survive the change of seasons, the stench of death always in the air, she completed the ritual by whispering, and I quote, light always overcomes darkness. Would you say that with me? Light always overcomes darkness. That skeleton of a woman, he writes, weakened by who knew how many years in the camp, forced Sally to light her own candle every chance she got, the imaginary candle. The woman and the girl lit their candles entirely in their minds while standing in ranks waiting to be counted, while marching to and from work in their bunks at night whenever they had a moment lining up for the, that insipid cabbage soup that they were given sometimes for a meal, they would light that imaginary candle. And so this brings me to your assignment. Everyone who worships regularly at the Temple of Light or listens to our messages on the World Wide Web knows that I always yes. give an assignment. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is this week, if you encounter any darkness anywhere, any problem, any obstacle, light an imaginary candle. Just imagine for a moment that you're lighting a candle and in your mind say, light always overcomes darkness. And then if you want in your prayer time in the evening, you can light a real candle. But remember to blow it out before you go to sleep. Light always overcomes darkness. Friends, you are indeed the light of your world. I want you to say it over and over until its full meaning is embodied in your very soul. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching, known as the Science of Mind, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, page 475, and I quote, there must come a time in our experience when we speak the conviction that is within us. This conviction of the spiritual universe in which we live is real and it is powerful. The light cannot be borrowed from another. Each has been furnished with a divine torch whose wick burns from the oil of the eternal, ever-renewing substance of faith in oneself and in every other self." Unquote. So you cannot borrow the light from another, but you can share your light, allowing its radiance to illumine and warm others. In Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16, the beautiful Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then here is his instruction, Anomi says so. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And he had told us elsewhere that heaven is where? At hand. It's right here. So when you glorify your Father in heaven, you're glorifying the Father that is within you. You are the temple of the living God. And his light, its light, her light, the light of all creation is burning on the altar of your heart in the temple of your lives. Eric Butterworth, one of the New Thought luminaries, wrote, and I quote, at any time, under any circumstances, we can turn on the light. And the infinite energy of love will dissolve darkness, heal broken relationships, and become a veritable protecting presence in your life. Man is a creature of light. And when he says man, he means they're mankind. When his light is shining brightly in all directions and in all situations, he is imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. Nothing shall be impossible unto him." Unquote. 
Butterworth cites a practical illustration. He says if you were to walk into a room and it was full of people who were being hampered in their work because there wasn't enough light and you had a lantern, would you turn it off or turn it down? Not at all. You would bring as much light as you possibly could to the situation. So why would you do otherwise in your life? If you come across a dark situation, rather than respond with being dark yourself, turn on your light. But as Butterworth points out, there is nothing difficult about letting your inner light shine, letting your divinity show. All we need to do is to, to correct our tendency to turn off your light when we face darkness. You know, I used to do that. I used to say to people, good morning, and they don't answer. So I stop and say, good morning. That's turning off your light. Say good morning. That's your light shining. It's up to them if they want to say good morning or not. And I used to say, good morning. You must say, there. <laughs> no, I just say, my light shines, and light always overcomes the darkness. So please turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. This is where we're going to play. You are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Maestro, you are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Let us sing the chant which we began our celebration with this morning and sing, you are the light. You are the light. You are the light, you are a light in this world, and you shine, and you shine, and you shine so bright, and you shine, and you shine, and you shine, and you shine so bright. We, we are the light, we are a light. World. And we shine, and we shine, and we shine so bright, and we shine, and we shine, and we shine so bright. Sing it to your neighbor. You are a light, you are a shine so bright and you shine and you shine and you shine so bright my friends every dark night will come to an end when the realization of our true nature as light beings dawns upon our consciousness and we allow our inner light shining on the altar of our hearts in the temple of our lives to dissipate the darkness of disbelief, prejudice, and fear. Whether or not you choose to light a candle as part of your spiritual work this week, or you just do it in your mind, set your intention to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, glorify your Father, which is in the heaven of your consciousness, and seek to find the light within themselves. You are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Namaste.